This video is full of at least 10 tips and tricks for new and returning Timberborn players. Actually, some of them are several tips rolled into one, so it's more like 20. But let's waste no more time and crack on with tip number one. First things first, go into the settings and tick Unlock Camera. Otherwise, you constantly get locked back into a certain view, which is annoying. You're welcome. Moving on. At the beginning of the game, you may as well set your beavers to work for 24 hours a day. Sure, they'll collapse through hunger and exhaustion, but they'll get stuff done. This only really works at the beginning of the game when their happiness doesn't matter. But as with any resource-focused game, their first few minutes will have a knock-on effect to the rest of your playthrough. So just set them to 24 hours until you have the basics up and running. Speaking of basics, your beavers only need food and water to survive, and enough wood to get those up and running. So let's look at the basic setup you should be aiming for in the early game to establish your colony. Starting with your district centre and a handful of beavers, you first need wood. So build a few lumberjack flags within range of some trees, link them up to the district centre by a path, highlight the trees to be cut, and your beavers will begin to collect wood. Then you need to use this wood to build a water pump, again connected by a path. Bear in mind you can easily rotate buildings by tapping R, and you can also create mirrored versions by tapping F, if you want the door to be on the other side for example. Then you'll want to build at least one storage tank for your water, and finally a farm where you should grow carrots. While speaking of food, feel free to ignore berries, because carrots and ideally some potatoes are a far better alternative. Carrots can be eaten raw and grow quickly, whereas potatoes can be grilled to give your beavers a nice early game stat boost. And don't forget to build a warehouse to stock up on your food too. Then after that you can build some housing and focus on unlocking a forester. The wild trees around you will grow back, but it becomes increasingly painful to wait for them. Fortunately, to take more control of the situation, you can grow and farm your own trees for wood. You'll need some research points for this, but that's easy enough. Just build an inventor hut and allocate a beaver to generate resource points, and eventually you'll unlock your forester. You'll also need to produce planks from a lumber mill, which needs power to operate, by building a water wheel and connecting up the power like so. Once your forester is up and running, you'll notice different trees take more or less time to grow and yield differing amounts of wood. Although it's tempting to grow fast-growing trees with a small yield or slow-growing trees with a high yield, growing a mixture of trees is not only a good idea for the early game, it's more fun than growing the same thing over and over. Certain trees can also be a good source of food or other resources as well as wood. But the mechanic for extracting those other resources can be confusing for new players. Let's use the mangrove tree as an example. If you want to harvest the mangrove fruit, you first need to make sure you don't have those trees highlighted to be chopped down by a lumberjack flag. Instead, you need to create at least one gatherer's flag within range. Unlike wood, you don't paint the trees you want the gatherers to pick the fruit from. They will do it automatically when the fruit is ready. But you can prioritise which resource they should gather. It takes time for the tree to grow and be ready to be chopped down for wood. And you'll also see another section here stating how many days it will take for the fruit to grow, with a percentage completion so you can see how close it is. You'll probably have noticed that land within a certain range of water is green, up to a point after which it goes brown and infertile. So you want to make sure you maximise your use of this limited green fertile land by only building your fields next to the water, and therefore keep your housing and industry away from it. This does mean constructing a series of power shafts to deliver the power generated by your water wheels to your buildings that require power. On that subject, once unlocked, it's useful to build these power shafts on top of platforms so your paths can pass underneath them. And it's useful to know that power can be transferred between buildings that are built right next to each other. So you do not need a power shaft going into each building separately. Speaking of power, the flow of water directly affects how much power your water wheels generate. The faster the flow, the more power that water wheel will deliver, increasing the productivity of the buildings being powered. So narrow channels of fast flowing water will deliver far more power than a slow moving wide river, especially if the water is running downhill. And watch out for bends in the river, around which your water wheels may hardly turn at all. 
the number of dam building options to control the flow of water can be overwhelming at first, but here are the basics you need to know. A dam will block water to a point, then allows water to spill over the top. These are ideal in the early game as they stop all of your water running away when a drought arrives, and you can build paths over them so your beavers can cross over the river. Levees are very similar to dams in principle, but the point at which water starts to spill over the top is higher and often means the surrounding area will begin to flood, depending on how high the river is compared to the river bank. Because of this, levees are ideal for redirecting the flow of water as you can literally build a wall of them. Floodgates, on the other hand, are essentially dams, but you can raise and lower the depth at which the water begins to pass through, and you can unlock floodgates of differing heights too. Ultimately, floodgates are best as they give you more control over how much water enters and leaves a system so you can fine-tune that balance of either maximizing water flow for increased power or increasing the water height to give you greater water storage to survive a drought, while avoiding flooding your buildings, which would stop them working and flood your crops. It's worth noting that beavers, being beavers, are perfectly happy moving in water and even constructing in it. They just need to have access to it, which usually is a simple case of constructing some stairs going down into the river. There are many items to research in this game, and for new players it can be difficult to know what to unlock first. Everyone has their preference and there's no real wrong answer, but you'll find it useful to unlock stairs and at least a single if not double platform to help you reach new places, and many players like to rush for the forester for reasons we've already discussed. It's also worth unlocking some well-being tools sooner than later as they provide noticeable buffs to your little beavers, increasing their work speed, movement speed and life expectancy. Well-being is good for business and should not be ignored. Eventually your beavers will die of old age, so it's important to constantly produce at least some baby beavers to replace the dead ones. But you also don't want to grow too fast, as that creates more mouths to feed. Controlling this doesn't have to be difficult. As the iron teeth, you just need two or three pods churning out babies to maintain your population. Plus you can pause them when you think your population is growing a bit too fast. The folktales need spare housing, enough happiness, and to not be working 24 hours a day to make beaver babies. So you can control your population growth by monitoring how many houses have two adult beavers because the empty third slot in that house will soon be filled by a baby. So broadly speaking, your population growth follows on from how many houses you build. Creating a new district can be tricky to understand at first. It's worth noting a district center is free to build, so you can actually move your district centers by simply deleting the original and building a new one, which can be very useful if a resource is slightly out of range. Just shift the district center closer. To create a new district, you need to first research to unlock, then construct a district crossing. One path goes into that crossing from the first district, and a path comes out of that crossing, which is where the new district begins. You can't have a path going around the district's crossing to link the two districts. It simply won't let you. One path in, one path out, via the district crossing. Shifting resources between districts can be a pain. By default, your beavers will automatically balance the amount of resources each district has based on their respective available storage by delivering and picking up resources to and from the district crossing. If, for example, you have a certain resource in District A and you want it to be moved to District C, but it has to go through District B, in order to get to C, you need to ensure District B in the middle has the relevant storage free for that resource, otherwise the beavers will not transfer it. Those are the tips that confused me when I first started playing Timberborn. It's a fun game, and hopefully you can get over the learning curve that much quicker with these tips. If you have any tips of your own, please share them in the comments below, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.